Hi. Hi, I'm Tim Carter. You're watching Ask the Builder. And, of course, we're streaming live. <laughs> Boy, that's pretty bright behind me. <laughs> uh, that is really bright. I spread out the Christmas lights, and it's really going on back there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> holy moly. Uh, so, anyway, thanks for joining today. It's going to be a pretty interesting live stream because we're going to talk about grout, floor grout. And you would think that it can't be that tough to do. Uh, it is and it isn't. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But before we jump into the floor grout, Stain Solver, they're sponsoring today's live stream. What a great company, right? I mean, they believe in me. <laughs> Stain Solver is a certified organic oxygen bleach. It's got two ingredients. Both are made in America. Uh, my wife and I own the company. It's a powder that you mix with water. And, you know, warm or hot water is best. And you end up with this magic cleaning solution that is non-toxic. There's no odor. It's fabric safe. It's color safe. So like this burgundy you know, corduroy shirt, if I got a really bad pasta stain on it or a grease stain, you could soak the whole shirt. Grease stain comes out, doesn't hurt the color, doesn't hurt the fabric. I mean, it's amazing. One of the really, really great things it cleans is floor tile grout. All right. So that's kind of fitting because we're going to be talking about grout in just a few moments. But I want to share this really funny story. This is how powerful stain solver is. <laughs> This is probably 10 years ago. And stains, a lot of people buy stain solver to clean their decks. All right. So I, I get that. I mean, it's, it's that's how I found out about it back 26, 27 years ago. This woman buys stain solver. She mixes it up. She decides to go out and clean her deck. She's got one of those sliding doors um, by her. I, you know, I guess dining room, kitchen area, whatever, sliding glass doors. So she goes out and starts cleaning the deck. She's sloshing the stain solver all around. Um, she's working in her stocking feet. I mean, she's she's got socks on. Why she didn't have shoes on, I don't know. It's none of my business. I really don't care. So I guess she had to hit, take a nature break, you know, and um, she... She's her socks. Understand this. Her socks are soaking with stain solver solution. She opens the door, walks in to, I guess, to go to the restroom, walks across the tile floor, <laughs> and she um, then she goes back outside to, to continue working. <laughs> and la later on, she comes inside and and there are these really light spots where her footprints were <laughs> on the tile. So she calls me up the next day and she's raving mad. I mean, like, you know, that saying hell hath no fury like that of a scorned woman. Well, you would think I scorned her. <laughs> so, you know, she's claiming she's going to sue me that the whole floor has got to be ripped out. Uh, stain solver ruined her tile floor. <laughs> and I had to break, I had to break the high. Hi, Louise. I had to break the, the news to her. And, and this is this is not an easy thing to do in that situation. Is that, hey, ma'am, I, I got bad news for you. Your tile floor and, and the ground in the floor is filthy dirty. <laughs> and what, what Stain Solver had done is where she had walked, it, it cleaned the floor. She thought that her tile floor was clean. Well, it, it was filthy. I mean, she sent me photos. So, um, I actually think that some of those products, you know, these fancy mops that have like a pad on it, I'm not going to mention them by name. I actually think that the the product, this liquid that you buy from the company, I actually think it's a dirt attractant. I mean, that's how many sunrises I've seen. But but I I actually believe that it leaves a residue that allows dirt to collect more frequently, which means you have to clean the floor with their product more frequently. But if you just get away from those machines and use stain solver, your worries go away. So anyway, if you 
buy some stain solver and you want to learn how to clean a tile floor and you may only have to scrub the grout one time. Once you get the grout clean, you'll never ever be on your hands and knees again. And I can tell you how to do that. Maybe, maybe we'll do a live stream about it one day, but not before Christmas. If you have any questions about your home, uh, it's going really good, Louise. It's going great. Uh, if you have a question about your home, put it in the uh, chat. And actually, I have a question. Do you see the two chat messages that I had typed earlier today? They're at the top. Do you see those or not? I'm curious. I see them. I just don't know if you see them or not. Uh, if you could let me know, I'd appreciate it. Uh, remember also, as the live stream goes on, if you like it, make sure you hit the like button. It's really, really important. Let's talk a little bit about grout. And I'm talking specifically about sanded grout that goes in between floor tiles. You may, in, in rare occasions, you may have floor tile that's got a very narrow uh, grout joint, you know, an eighth of an inch or less, um, and, and you can use unsanded grout, but most tile floors uh, use sanded grout. Let's first of all talk about the grout. So what's the difference between sanded and unsanded grout? Uh, the best way to describe that, it, it's not the greatest analogy, but I'm going to use it anyway. It would be the difference between concrete and bricklayer's mortar. So in bricklayer's mortar, there are no, no big stones. I mean, the sand that's used to make brick mortar is actually rock, but it's very, 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 very tiny pieces of sand. And you may not even know that. You may not realize that's all sand is. All sand is is just very tiny pieces of rock. But concrete, you know, has got Portland cement, sand, and stones in it. And the stones come in different sizes. Whereas bricklayer's mortar is just Portland cement, maybe a little bit of hydrated lime, and the sand. Okay, so sanded grout is just a mixture of Portland cement and fine silica sand. And they use silica sand on purpose because, uh, number one, it's almost clear, which is very good. You don't want, it's got, the sand has got to be completely uniform in color. And in the case of sanded grout, because they add dry pigments to them, you don't want the sand to take away from the color of that's being added to the grout. So that's why you have to use silica sand. Another reason is the silica is so strong. It's, you know, one of the very hardest, um, you know, it's, I mean, silica's got a hardness of seven on the uh, uh, moss scale, if I'm not mistaken from my geology days. Pretty hard uh, mineral. All right, so the what happens is the the silica sand in the sanded grout gives the grout much greater strength than without it, and it allows you to put in wider grout joints than you would otherwise. When you use unsanded grout, uh, the maximum joint you can go is about an eighth of an inch. If you go much bigger than that you'll almost always get a shrinkage cracks. And the sanded grout prevents that. Now, you can get shrinkage cracks with sanded grout, but you'd have to put in a pretty wide joint, you know, maybe an inch wide joint, which is very rare. You would never, you, you would never put in a joint that big. Most sanded grout joints are three-eighths of an inch wide, quarter inch, three-eighths, in rare occasions, all the way up to a half inch. You know, you might see a half inch joint uh, with Mexican tile. Like I, I helped um, rehabilitate a friend of mine out in Southern California has outdoor Mexican tile uh, patio, and it had half-inch grout joints. Okay, so the key thing about grout and Portland cement is this. So water is your friend, but it's also your enemy. So that's that's a that's kind of a bad deal. And, and this is true with, with making bricklayer's mortar, making concrete. If you add too much water, um, you, you, you get a problem. I mean, it really weakens the grout. And when I do, when I answer emails from people who, who they, you know, they say they grouted this, and a week later, the grout's falling apart, it's crumbling, it's cracking. Um, I almost always ask them, I say, can you describe what the consistency of the grout was, you know, when you were applying it? And almost always, you know, it was very thin. Um, I'm trying to give you an example of what it might, like a very wet applesauce. That, that, would, be, that would be way too wet. So, hi, Becky. <laughs> oh, good. That's interesting. You saw the 
Yeah, I don't know. That's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to have to try to copy those and put them back in. All right, I'll do that in a minute. Because there's there are some videos you need to watch. I actually, everything I'm talking about, I have, I've have i already done in video, and I need you, I suggest you to watch those videos, and I gave the links. That's really interesting. I wonder why they disappeared. All right, doesn't matter. I'm learning more and more about how this whole interface, this dashboard that I have to work with. So <clears throat> when you mix the grout, you have to add a little bit of water time. The And you'll see in the videos, I show you exactly what the grout's supposed to look like. Uh, the, about the best way to describe it, I think, the consistency would be really delicious mashed potatoes. So you know how mashed potatoes, like I think of that because we just had them for Thanksgiving. So mashed potatoes, think about it. Um, you know, when they're on your plate, they pretty much stick together. Um, if you turn your plate upside down, they probably would stay on the plate, and not fall off. Uh, but when you take your fork, you can move them around pretty easily. It's not like a really hard clump. Okay, that's what you want the sanded grout to be like. That's how you want to mix it. When you mix it, the biggest mistake you could make would be if you have a small bag of it, you would like you, you would never want to pour the whole bag in the bucket and then start adding water. <laughs> Because almost invariably you add too much water and now you're in trouble. So you always want to only mix about two thirds of the bag. And you only want to mix enough grout that you can use, especially if you're a rookie. You only want to mix as much as you can use in 20 minutes because you, you don't want the grout to start to get hard and you don't want to add water to it again. All right. So that covers the water part of, of mixing the grout. The videos that I've got show you how to install it. And rather than go through that whole process, um, you, I'm just going to hit the high points. Uh, number one, you have to use the right trowel. It's a rubber float. It's got like a hard edge. It's a, it's a really wonderful tool to, tool to use. It's, a, it's almost like the same rubber, but a little harder that window washers use to uh, squeegee off windows. And the reason why is, is because you you know, you you when you strike that joint and you pull the excess grout off the tile, you want to get as much off as you can because the more grout that you leave behind, the harder it is to uh, to, to to clean up the tile, and you can make a huge mess. And that's also where you could ruin the grout because remember what I said just before that the water is both your friend and your enemy. All right, remember if you have questions about your home. Uh, it, you, it, this is ask anything. This is the, the live streams work best when you ask questions. And I, I really don't care what it is. Uh, your question could even be anything to do with, you know, how Ask the Builder works. Maybe you're curious about the Ask the Builder business. So feel free to poke around there a little bit and see what you find out. So the, the only, most of the tiles that you install are glazed. All right. So that glaze is really just ultra thin layer of glass. And what I've done sometimes in the past is right before I apply the grout and I'm moving it around with the this rubber float, I'll sometimes take a sponge and just put a very, very thin coat of water. I mean, just like wipe it lightly just to transform the tile from, you know, dry to just slightly damp. You would never want to get water in the joints, right? So what that water does, it acts like a lubricant. And so, you know, it, it makes the grout easier to move around. And you'll see this when you watch the four. There's a four video series that you're going to need to watch. And uh, it's going to show you exactly what to do. Once the, grout, the, the, once the grout's in the joints and you've got it pretty much to the shape you want it to be, it's the right depth, you just kind of leave it alone. Don't start to work with it. Just leave it alone. And what's going to happen is the, the edges of the tile typically are not glazed. And there is suction in that clay, meaning it, it readily accepts the water. And this is also a problem for tile getting stained because if a really, like if you were to drop a, a bottle of India ink on tile and, and that ink get into the grout, it can actually work its way into the tile and under the glaze. And then it's the tile's ruined. All right. So that unglazed edge of the tile starts to pull water out of the grout, which is a good thing because you want the grout to get a little stiff uh, and uh, to where if you push your thumb into it, you could make an imprint 
uh, but not, not like very light, meaning if you just pushed your thumb in very lightly and it left an imprint, it's still too wet to work with. Then what will happen is you use a special sponge. Uh, you squeeze all the water out of it. Uh, you get every drop out that you possibly can. You wipe it across the joints a certain way, very lightly, and you start forming the joint and it, making it look perfect. And you can flip the sponge over. And the key is to keep the sponge clean. And you're going to use a lot of water in this process. And you're going to be changing out the buckets frequently. Because if you don't do that, when the everything's dry, you get this big haze on the tile. It's called a grout haze. And if you have too much grout haze, it looks horrible. I mean, it's it looks bad and it's hard to get off. It can be very hard to get off. So uh, what I always recommend... And then we're going to switch gears. Um, I have, yeah, Louise, I do have pictures of, you, have, you want to know if I have pictures of tiles? Yeah, on my website. You know that to be the case. If you, anytime you want to see a picture, uh, if, if especially if you want to see, you can see some really good pictures of dirty and clean tile and, and, and at the Stain Solver website too. Just go to stainsolver.com, type in tile, and look at all the search results. You're going to see some dramatic, some really beautiful ceramic tile jobs, slate jobs. And and um, and you can do the same thing at askthebuilder.com. And you'll see all types of photographs of tile. All right. So the, the key thing is, is that if you use too much water, if that sponge, when you're striking those grout joints, is too wet, once again, you're introducing extra water to the grout and you're going to weaken the grout. And this is where most uh, rookie tile installers make a big mistake. The, the sponge is way, way, way too wet. And I mean it. When you dip that sponge in, rinse it out, you have to squeeze it. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze until you get like every drop of water out of it to where the sponge is just damp. So if you have any questions about this whole process, just type them in the chat. If you have any questions about your home, type them in the chat. Right now, I'm going to try to grab these two um, links and recopy them. See if I can. Uh, let's see if I pin it. What happens? Um, yeah, I'm not. Here we go. So here, I don't know why these weren't showing up. Isn't that funny? All right. So there's the one. And now I'm trying to get to the other one. Let's see if this let's see if this link copies correctly. I don't know if it's cut off or not. Um, I don't know. I don't know that this one's going to work. So I'm going to go grab it. I think I have that video up, um, and I will um, recopy that second link to make sure it works. So I'm going to put grout floor tile in the search engine at Ask the Builder, and see what comes back. Um, there we go. Get that server woken up. <laughs> and right here, the that's the grout floor tile series. So this is a particular page at my website that has the four videos. Uh, you know, you need to watch videos one, two, three, and four. So watch these four videos. And it will, if that doesn't explain everything to you, and, and I've gotten so many positive comments over the years about these this video series, because it's really, really helped people. And that, of course, is my whole mission here. That's that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help you save time and money. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's really what it's all about, right? So, all right. All right. So here we go. Suiz has a, uh, has a question. Um, what if there's less water on the tile? So, okay, I know what you mean. If you don't, if you don't put a sponge, if you don't sponge across the top of the tile, you can still grout. And and you know, tile setters do it all the time. Uh, it, it, you're not going to damage the tile. Uh, if, if you're if you have a an unglazed tile, and most tile is not unglazed because it's just it just would fall apart and. It's, there's there's all kinds of problems with unglazed tile, but if you did have one, um, maybe maybe the if you pressed really hard with the rubber float, you might scratch the tile with the silica sand. But you're not going to scratch the glaze when you 
when if you using the the sanded grout and the tiles glazed, you're not going to scratch the tile. Guarantee you. I've never done it. So I mean, if you take a screwdriver on at me and press really hard, you, you'll scratch the grout, or the the glaze, but on the tile. But you're not going to do it with the tiny pieces of silica sand that are in that sanded grout. That was a great question, by the way. So yeah, you want to watch these. Um, the definitely the the, uh, the the hopefully the first link works where it's mixing you know the grout, but the uh, the um, it looks like the links copied correctly. Let me know if they don't. If you if you're clicking one of those links and and you're not brought to a page on Ask the Builder where there are some videos, let me know. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So here's another thing that happened. Uh, this is kind of exciting, but it, it 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 came a few hours ago. I told you last week that I had been contacted by the public relations company that uh, at Stanley Black and Decker. They now own the Craftsman brand. So if you have been around a while, you, you know that Craftsman was an enormous brand that Sears built over decades. Um, I mean, it was really cranking probably 30 years ago, uh, the Craftsman brand. And that was the primary reason that Sears hired Bob Vila away from this old house. He got, he got a very, very lucrative deal to, to be the spokesman for the Craftsman Tools, I think, for about 10 years. Anyway, so Sears cratered. You know, I don't I don't think Sears is even around anymore. And But so Stanley Black & Decker went to the fire sale and purchased the Craftsman brand. So they're manufacturing tools. So I get this, this big box came today, and it's got, I, I haven't opened it yet. But it's got eight power tools in it. I mean, it's got, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to miss some. It's got a drill. It's got a drill driver. It's got a circular saw, a reciprocating saw, an oscillating tool, uh, orbital sander, a light, and I think something else. Well, who knows? One or two other things. And it's got the batteries and um, I'm sure a charger in there. Probably a carrying bag too for all these tools. So. I'm going to show those tools tomorrow. I'm going to feature those on the on, on the live stream so you can at least see them. Uh, I forget what the price is for these eight tools, but it's probably affordable. But once I see, I, before I even open the box, I can pretty much predict what I think these tools are going to be like. And what you need to understand is this. So... Just like many things, not all thing, not all circular saws are made the same way. And they're not made the same way for a reason. They don't need to be made the same way. In other words, the circular saw that I used on the job site every day, and literally I would use the saw eight hours a day, day after day after day after day. All right. You're not going to use your circular saw at your home eight hours a day, day after day after day. So why why build it as well as my saw all right that i mean if you're a manufacturer if you know anything about marketing you know that the marketplace is segmented into different buyers who have different needs so my prediction is that these craftsman tools in this kit are are targeted directly for the average homeowner who maybe needs a circular saw once every 3 months and you only need it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I just have a feeling, you know, in other words, you're not going to, you might stress this saw. I don't know this for a fact yet, but you might stress this saw if you decide you're going to use it all day long for a week to build a deck project. We're going to find out. But um, I'm not going to put it through that kind of a test right now. I, I don't have the time, but uh, maybe some other tool website might do that. But just understand that there are different uh, tools you know, made on purpose because they all don't need to do the same thing, even though they look the same. They don't all need to work the same amount of hours each day. I guess that's the best way to put it. Hi, William. How you doing? Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a Monday and uh, I'm here. And also, <laughs> per, uh, I don't see Steve. Steve's not here yet. Hopefully he's not under the weather. Uh, Steve recommended that I take my YouTube um this is like a wall hanging. It's a, th th this part of it is a mirror. It's 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 just like just like a mirror. It's it's 
probably is a mirror. I don't know. It could be just highly polished aluminum. But it's a wall plaque that was given to me maybe a year or two ago. I just got it in the mail one day. I think I got an email. Uh, maybe I got a card in the mail, a congratulations card. I think it was even signed by Susan. Uh, I have a hard time pronouncing her name. Well, well Jackie was Jackie. She's the CEO of, of YouTube. Uh, and if you don't know who she is, nice woman. I got to meet her once years ago. Uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, Larry and Sergey, the founders of Google, uh, were in a need of a space to start their company. And they used Susan's garage. <laughs> so they, they leased her garage or rented her garage at her house. <laughs> and that's where they started the company. That That's the tale I've been told. And um, then she eventually came to work with them. And she's uh, in charge of YouTube. Uh, nice woman. All right. So when I got to 100,000 subscribers, uh, they sent me this nice uh Steve called it the silver play button. And when he said that last week, I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought he was talking about some kind of button down here on, on my dashboard. So anyway, uh, all right. So I just want to remind you, if you have any questions about your home, uh, no matter what it is, just type it in the chat. Happy to uh, happy to help you. Uh, happy to solve a problem. I was I did. Let me let me get something to drink. And I'll tell you a really interesting consult call I did about an hour and a half ago. So I've been doing these consult calls a long time. I don't know, 15, 20 years. And I work just like a cab driver. You know, cabs, you're just paying by the minute, you know. So, But I, I charge in chunks of time, 15 minutes at a time. It's all at my shopping cart. You can go look if you're interested. So an order came in earlier today. It was a woman who owned, she owns a home in Washington, D.C., and it was really an interesting problem in a way. She, it's a, The house was built almost 100 years ago. It was built in 1924. It was a brick home. She sent me about four photos, but they were all of just like a side wall. I never got to see a picture of the front of the home. But they were having trouble with the paint bubbling in the dining room. And this, everybody who's come over is tracing it to the brick. And based on the photos they sent me, I probably agree. The They had gotten a quote. This is where you have to be really careful. <clears throat> and this is where I feel, I guess it's just like a medical situation. In other words, if if you went to your doctor and, and you got a pretty significant diagnosis of, of an illness or that you needed surgery, uh, it probably would pay to get a second opinion. All right. It just, all right. I mean, unless it was an emergency. So I maintain that the same is true for your home. If you have what appears to be a serious problem with your home and you, you call up some contractors and they come over and, you know, one, one says this and one says that they're not agreeing on, on what the problem is or the solution. But what we do know <clears throat> is that they both have a dog in the fight. And here's the other thing you need to understand. I feel it's more and more likely that they don't even really know what the problem, what's causing the problem, because they might not have enough life experience. All right. So what can you do to solve the problem? Well, you can call me. I don't have a dog in a fight. I mean, I can get on the phone with you. All right. I'm not trying to sell you the phone console. I'm just trying to show you why it makes a good idea. You know, let's get this thing tilted up a little bit. So um, anyway, Edith thought it was a good idea. I look at the photos. I ask some questions. I was a little stunned that the house was um, built in 1924. Excuse me. I actually thought that it was probably built in the last 30 years. Anyway, the advice was, and this, you may find this fascinating. The advice was use a silane siloxane clear water repellent, an oil-based one. Make sure you read the instructions on the label. Most people don't, you, you know, you just want to hire somebody and you want the pain to go away and you don't know whether they're doing the job right or not. So you 
need to buy the product. You need to read the label and then fine. You can have a conversation with the painter or the handyman or whoever's going to spray it on. But this product, it's clear. They make it both water and oil base. Oil base will penetrate farther. And the key, this is the secret that a lot of people don't know. <clears throat> and this is where the, the, the gray or the white hair comes in. You really want two people to be putting this on. All right. So the one person has got the garden hand pump sprayer and he's spraying the wall. You know, he's getting the wall nice and wet. You know, and he moves over two or three feet. Well, immediately behind him is a guy who's got one of those backpack leaf blowers, a really good one. And he's got that nozzle aimed right at the wall and he is blasting the wall with air, you know, maybe 40, 50, 60 miles per hour. I mean, those things are, some of them are very powerful. And what's the air doing? It is pushing the sealer deep into the brick. And that's what you want. So you may spray a little on. He may blow it. He's done blowing that little area. Then you come back and spray a little bit more on. He blows it again. You know, and that whole thing, that whole operation in that one spot could happen. You could have it sprayed maybe twice in 20 seconds. All right. So uh, that's what I explained to Edith. Uh, you know, her husband, she wanted to know, well, could we, um, can we do it next week? Well, I said, I don't know. I said, I doubt you're going to find some of that quickly. But more importantly, you have to read the label to see what the, the outside temperature has to be. So this is another reason why from now on, you need to be more proactive. You need to almost become your own general contractor. I know you want to trust the, the contractors, but if you read my email each day, and you saw the problems that, that people are coming to me, and, and probably 90% of the time, <laughs> it can be traced back to where the homeowner, which would be you, um, you, you just trusted the contractor and you, you know, you, um, you just thought he was going to do it right. You didn't bother to read the label of the product, how to install it. And even if it's a like putting in a door, you would think, oh my gosh, that's got to be complex. You need to understand that those instructions are written for a person with an IQ generally of less than 100. You're going to have no trouble understanding it. So that's why you need to read all of these instructions, read the product labels before the contractor shows up. I know it sounds crazy. And if you don't know which products to get, guess what? I can tell you. That's how it works. You can, you can um, even chat me right now and ask me a question about what's the best product to use where. Hi, Disney. How you doing? Pleasure to have you here. Hi, Holt. Uh, Minnesota. A little cold up there today. Uh, and been following for years. Thank you. Thanks for following me. No way. <laughs> You've got a friend named Tim Carter. That's pretty unusual. Uh, that's that's really interesting. So thanks very much. Um, I plan to keep doing this a while longer. I'm having a blast. Uh, so, um, and I'm trying to do better with these live streams. I'm trying to make them more interesting. I got I got a, a comment over the weekend from somebody who, who watched one after the fact, and he just said it was a bunch of blather. <laughs> you know, I get, you know, you, here's one thing I learned a long time ago, and, and it's impossible to satisfy everybody. I just might as well give up. I mean, if you haven't already discovered that in your life, uh, it's time that, that somebody tell you to stop trying because you're, you're never going to satisfy everybody. In fact, it's really amusing. I'll say this real quickly. Sometimes I'll work really hard. In the past, I've worked really hard on a video. And, you know, when I do my videos, I frequently do a lot of cutaway shots, which means there's a lot of editing. I try to keep the video very engaging. You know, unlike this, I mean, the trouble with this live stream is, is the worst thing you want to be in a way. I, 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 in other words, I'm just this talking head and it can get pretty boring. So that's why in video, you want to put a lot of cutaway shots. Anyway, so um, <laughs> even when I put a good video up, you know, all of a sudden you'll get a thumbs down or, you know, and I just wonder, I go, what could you, what was there to dislike about that video? I mean, I don't take it personally, but I just go, I don't understand it. So it doesn't matter. All right, so let's see what. Remember, if you got questions, put them in the chat. 
the your questions are what make the live stream interesting if you've not figured that out yet. So it's really important to to ask questions in the chat. All right, William, let's see what you got here. We have a hole approximately one and a half feet long and a foot wide. We have patched it several times. It's probably one inch deep. How is the best way to do it? Here's you left out a very important part of the equation. I have no idea, William, what it is that the hole is in. Is it in your hardwood floor? Is it a hole in the roof? Is it a hole in the wall? <laughs> is it a hole in your driveway? What's the material that we're working with here? So you, you need to give all the data. All right. So Jack is here. I'll go to Jack and William, I'll wait for you to tell me what, what it is we're patching. I used a Porter cable seven and a quarter inch uh, to build houses from 61 to 83, and it is still working. Yeah, there you go. It's, uh, that's really interesting, Jack. Um, my, I have down in my garage, I should probably get it out of the garage. One of the first power tools I bought was in 1974, 75, and I bought a Porter cable screw gun, and I still have it. And the last time I used it, it still worked. I have another one that I, I like the adjustment a little bit better, but Porter Cable back in the day. So let's see, you said uh, 61. So yeah, you're a little older than I am. So I would have bought mine, like I said, about 13 years later. Uh, boy, they made some really good stuff. I mean, really good, good, uh, good power tools. Uh, it's concrete. Okay, so there we go, William. So you're trying to patch concrete. E that's an easy job. Um, I have some really good columns on my Ask the Builder website, as you might you might surmise, about patching concrete. Um, the key, first of all, um, William, I where do you live at, William? Are you? Um, I mean, it's got to be cold where you're at. I mean, you're are you down in Florida? Where are you? I, I was just trying to figure out where you are. Uh, it's in the floor concrete. Okay, is it inside or outside? I'll wait for you to type. Um, you like the background. Yeah. Yeah. Lights in the YouTube. I, I explained the YouTube button before. That's that's the silver play button that you get when you get to 100,000 subscribers. All right. So, so William, is it inside or outside um, <clears throat> the, the concrete? I'm, I'm going to assume for sake of discussion, we'll just say that it's inside. How's that sound? like a basement floor, because that means that you can fix it now. So the key thing is get all the um, get all of the loose material out of there. You've got to clean it. Like I would scrub it. Uh, you live in North Carolina, but is the concrete inside or outside? Let's, well, like I said, I'm just going to assume it's inside because that way you could. OK, good. All right. It is inside. All you got to do is uh, get all the dust out, clean it out. Scrub it with soap and water, rinse it, let it dry. Uh, and then you're going to, uh, you said that it was uh, foot wide. You patch it several times, probably one inch deep. All right. So you're going to make up, I, I would just patch it. Uh, you're probably going to have to use two different materials um, because I'm sure it's shaped like this, where I doubt that it's exactly one inch down across and one inch up. I doubt it's that way. It's more, it kind of starts and goes down at an angle, gets one inch deep, and then kind of comes back up where it's thin. So since you're one inch deep, the one inch deep places really need to have some stones in the repair material. So that would be called pea gravel concrete. And uh, you just mix it three to one. So three parts stone, two parts sand, one part cement. I like to put in, I like to make it one and a half cement to make it a little richer. All right. So, and you would only use this pea gravel concrete. And you got to make sure the peas, the, the gravel is truly pea size, the size of a green pea, which would be about the tip of, of my baby finger, about three eighths of an inch diameter. All right. You would only use this material where the total thickness is like one inch. Um, you don't want to you don't want it real thin. So then, because where it's any thinner than three quarters of an inch, you need to just use medium sand and Portland cement. 
And that I mix two to one, you know, like two parts sand, one part cement. You could put a little bit more cement in if you want. All right. So the key, though, here's the key. This is where most people make a mistake is once you're ready to patch and it's clean, you need to take a, uh, like an old spray bottle and lightly spritz where you're going to patch, get it lightly damp, and then you have to coat it with a coat of cement paint. And you're going to go, what's cement paint? I have no idea. <laughs> All right. That's because most people don't know what it is. It's an old, old trick taught to me by old concrete masons like 50 years ago. All cement paint is, is just Portland cement, which is that gray powder that you mix with clear water and you make it to the consistency of latex paint. And cement, that's the glue that holds everything together. So you're going to paint that whole rough area with this cement paint. You're not going to put it on super thick. You would just paint it on just like you would put the first coat of paint on a piece of wood. You don't want it too thick. All right. But you need to then immediately cover it with the patching material. And, and, and if you have the blend of pea gravel concrete, the blend of just regular medium sand and cement, and, and you get and you use a stick to screed it off with, and you take a, a rubber float once it gets a little hard enough and you you know you swirl it, that patch is never coming up again. Never. You know, but same thing, I don't want you putting a lot of water when you mix it. The, both mixtures, the, the mixture of the mortar, the mixture of the sand and the cement should be like firm applesauce. You know, uh, it, should, should, it should not be thin and runny. If you put too much water in, it just makes it all weak. So that's how you fix it. All of this information, <clears throat> William, is at my website. Just go to askthebuilder.com, type cement paint, C-E-M-E-N-T, one word, and then paint, P-A-I-N-T, into the search engine. Read all of the columns about cement paint. Believe me, if you take that extra time, uh, it's going to pay off in spades. All right. You're, yeah, exactly. Most people have never heard of it before. It's a great, great trick. And that patch will never come up. Never, ever, never. All right. Uh, if you have any other questions, now's the time to ask them. Would love to help you. If you like what you hear, remember, always hit the like button. Um, tomorrow, if you just joined the stream tomorrow, I'm going to share with you eight new tools that I got today from Craftsman, the people at Craftsman. And it's going to be kind of exciting to see them. I think they're all going to be kind of like miniature tools. They're not going to be big, beefy tools that I would use on a job site because the size of this box, I, 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 there's no way that I could fit eight of my tools in this box. There's just no way. So it's I, I'm excited to open this box up in the morning. I'm going to open it up tomorrow morning. Um, okay, so once again, if you've got a question about your home, please put it in the chat. Happy to uh, Happy to help you. Happy to help you. I had another uh, person ask me a question over the weekend, <clears throat> one of my newsletter subscribers. And by the way, if you don't already subscribe to my Ask the Builder newsletter, you should. There's all kinds of reasons why. Always some great information. Like this week, I had a little fun. <laughs> I didn't get any complaints. I thought I would. I um, I had seen this video before. So so I want you, actually, you could you could have some fun with this. <clears throat> Just go to askthebuilder.com right now, or when at your earliest convenience, and you'll see one of the navigation links is Q&A. And let me explain something about that Q&A button. When I upload a new page to the website, it automatically appears on that Q&A page, and the newest material is at the top. So we loaded a, a brand new column this morning. But over the weekend, I I um I put up a quick one, a quick new page that has two videos on it, and the title of the page is uh, "God Is a Woman." <laughs> all right, now you have to have a sense of humor here. All right, so, <laughs> but I had seen this one video a few years ago, and it was really, it's one of these videos. It's a very short one. It was professionally done, probably only lasts two minutes, three minutes, if that. But it's one that after you watch the video, I mean, you're in such a good mood. I mean, you're just like, you might even be laughing out loud. So you need to go watch that video. <clears throat> Let me know what you think. <clears throat> and then there's a video of me 
<clears throat> right below it, trying to be an actor. <laughs> so I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to, if, if Hollywood calls, I'm not answering. <laughs> I just don't think I can do it. I, I, I suck at it. All right. Um, all right. So William's got a question about, uh, hi, hi, Vanessa. How you doing? Pleasure to have you here. Um, Will's got a question. Do I prefer shingles or metal roofing? So that, that's a great, I should have a copy of my book here. I don't have it in the office. Um, I, um, first of all, asphalt shingles are popular here in America. Actually, in a lot of other parts of the world, they're not popular. <laughs> uh, I wish Steve was here <laughs> because he would tell you that I don't know many builders at all in the United Kingdom that would ever even think about putting asphalt shingles on. So it's like a disposable product here in America and they're low cost and builders across the world have a different feeling about roofs than most roofers do and builders in America. Let me tell you. All right. So uh, long story short, to answer your question, I would, I would take a metal roof all day long over shingles. But the trouble with metal roofing is it doesn't look good on all homes. Now, there are when I go to church each Sunday, I pass a house that has a metal roof on it, but it, it's it's uh, interlocking pieces of metal. It almost looks like a shingled roof. It has a completely different texture. It's not the long strips of standing seam metal. So I, I just, you know, I just don't like the look. So I have on my own home... A synthetic slate. So most people who come to my home think I have a real slate roof. It, it's that realistic. Uh, so shingles would be my last choice. But if you have to go with asphalt shingles, then you absolutely want to put a strip of copper <clears throat> at the top of the um, of the roof so that your shingles last 40 or 50 years. Because if you don't put the copper on, you might be replacing your shingles in 10 years. So I'm going to type a, I'm going to type a URL that you can go to and read the first three or four chapters of my book for free. So go to this website, HTTPS roofing rip off.com. All right. So, so go to that website. And when you get to that website, you'll see a navigation button that says free, click the free button download the down, the PDF file and start reading away. This is a really short book, by the way. You could read the entire book in an hour or less. But I give the first three or four chapters away for free. All right. So if you have to go with asphalt, you can put some copper on and your, your shingles will last for a very long time. And here, I'll show you what the copper looks like. Uh, I'm going to get a um, picture for you. There's a website that has uh, a picture of the of the copper installed on, on my daughter's home, actually. And you can see exactly how it would be. Now, in this picture, we had just put the copper on. It was probably only on a week or two, so it's very shiny. But understand that, that now when you go to a house, if you're standing on the ground because of the pitch of the roof, you can hardly even see it because it's turned a very nut brown. And from the ground, I mean, you just it doesn't even show up. And especially if you have a darker roof and she happens to have a light gray roof and still can hardly see it. So, but this, that second link that takes you to my shopping cart, that shows you how much copper should be installed at the peak of your roof on each side. So, and what happens here, it's, this is simple. When the sun hits the copper, uh, it actually blasts some of the copper off the ultraviolet rays here are these tiny, tiny microscopic pieces of copper sitting there. The next time it rains, the rain washes the copper down onto the roof and the copper, you know, it chemically bonds with the asphalt. And that makes the asphalt, it tricks the asphalt into thinking that it's brand new. And that's a good thing. You, you want your asphalt up on your roof to keep thinking that it's a year old or two years old. That's the whole idea. So... The more copper that washes down on the on the shingles, the longer the roof's going to last, is all I can tell you. All right, if you have any other questions, now's the time to put them in. Uh, I'd love to answer your questions. And um, because that's what keeps the, the live stream alive. I wish you could see these Christmas lights. I'm telling you, on my monitor, they're so bright. 
Uh, it's like the colors all washed out. But here in person, they're all vibrant. I mean, a very vibrant green, blue, red, um, orange. I mean, they're beautiful. But here they're just so washed out. Oh, my gosh. Okay, William, dealing, so we're dealing with electricity. What's the difference between neutral and a ground? Boy, that's a good question. So I'm not an electrical engineer. So here we're going to, um, um, I'm going to kind of go to the edge and uh, of my comfort zone and explain what I know. So stand by. Okay. So <clears throat> if you ever notice, the um, if you just have standard 240 volts coming into your home from the electric company, <clears throat> there are two, there are three wires that come into your home. All right. There, there's two black and generally <clears throat> they're kind of wound around a bare aluminum wire. So the uh, bare aluminum one is neutral or quote unquote ground. <clears throat> and the two black wires are each 120 volts but they are different phases of 120 volts. So um, that's how we get 240 volts. So in other words, remember that, that alternating current, the waveform looks like this. I mean, it looks like just a big roller coaster, you know, so, you know, it goes up and down and, and, and you have 60 of those high points that pass by every seconds, you know, so it's 60 cycles per second. All right. That's the standard, electricity that's in most residential homes in America. All right. Or I'm going to say all. Here's how it works. If you take one of those, and maybe you've seen this happen before, if you take one of those black wires up on the, that's up, up in the air, and you bring it to the ground, like you strip the end of it off, and you bring it to the ground, and you touch the ground, it's going to, have you ever seen a welder arc weld? you know, where you see that blue flame, the smoke coming up and he's welding and he's got to wear the special hood with a special visor and the special glass so he doesn't burn his eyes up, you know. Uh, all right, that's going to happen with that, with, that, with that wire that the guy is holding on the ground. He's going to arc weld the ground because there's no circuit breaker between his hand and the wire. It's just going to keep welding until he melts the wire or until the electricity shuts off. And if you've ever seen videos on YouTube of where live wires have been brought down by a storm, you'll see this arcing happening on the ground. That's why it's so dangerous. If you're in a car, you don't want to be jumping out of a car that's knocked down electrical wires. You get killed. All right, so <clears throat> the, reason think, the reason your computer's working right now is because its resistance between, it slows that flow of electricity down. In other words, light bulbs, your toaster, your vacuum cleaner, um, your blender, those things all offer resistance. So the electricity is trying to get to ground or neutral, but it hits that daggone electric motor in the blender and it goes, whoa, this is hard. And it's got to spin that thing around. And so... That resistance is why you don't have arc welding going on inside your blender, all right? And it's the same way inside a light bulb. So the electricity comes up into the, the old-fashioned incandescent light bulb, and it tries. It's like goes, oh, man, we're going to go to ground right now, man. We are going to arc weld this thing. It hits that tungsten filament and goes, oh, my. It's like going through molasses like or quicksand. Like, oh, my gosh, like sticky mud. The electricity just can't do it. but it moves enough, it moves enough that it causes the tungsten to get hot and create light. All right, so long story short, <laughs> neutral and ground are pretty much the same thing. Um, but an electrical engineer, I wish my buddy Dave Benson were here sitting next to me, he would explain to you exactly what the difference is. But in your electric panel, get this. In your electric panel, if you just have a standard electric panel, um, when those three wires come from the pole outside, come down into your house, into your electric panel, the two black wires go to either of the two bus bars in the center of the electric panel, and that silver cable goes to a bus bar on the side, 
in both the white neutral wires and the bare copper ground wires get attached to that one bus bar. So that's why it's pretty much the same thing. But there are electrical engineers that would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a little bit of a difference between a neutral and a ground. But when you open up the inside of an electrical panel, you'd go, you'd say to the electrical engineer, well, they're all, they're all together here, right here. So you tell me what the difference is. All right. So I can't tell you what that difference is. But for the most part, it's pretty much the same thing. So I hope that, hope that explains it to you. Um, great question, by the way. William. Uh, that's a great question. He, you're asking, are termites uh, a problem all over the U.S. and the world? So there's an old saying, um, if you're a, a, a pest control person, I had a good friend in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, his name was Rick, who owned a pretty big uh, pest control company, sold it recently. And it, there's a saying amongst those people that say there are two types of houses. There are the houses that have had termites and the houses that are going to have termites. All right, so the termite problem, if you can go online and you can look at a map and there's a map that shows you the severity of termite infestation. And what you'll discover is that termites are much more prevalent in areas where it's warm and where it's moist, all right? So you're gonna see that they're a really big problem in Louisiana. A uh, big problem in Florida, you know, down in the southern southern row states along the Gulf Coast. Um, they can be a problem in Minnesota. They were a problem in Ohio. I mean, I had I had termites that ate up my kids' playset, outdoor playset, treated lumber. There's photos of it on my website. You can go look at it. Just uh, just type into um, uh, the search engine termite damage treated lumber. And, and look at the photo. That photo was my one of the four by fours that was in the ground. Termites ate it all up. All right. So it is a problem that termites are all around the world. Uh, but like I said, if you look at a map and you understand how they live, they really like <clears throat> warm, moist conditions. All right. That's that's where they really, really thrive. But um, so you're, you, you know, you're not going to I mean, they can be out west. They can be in California. I mean, it's not, it's it's drier, dr much drier out there, but they they can have termite problems. So uh it's it can be a big, it can be a big issue. So you really have to be on 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 the ball about it. Big, they're a huge problem in Hawaii, huge problem in the Caribbean. All right. So anyway, all right. Great question, by the way. Uh neutral is grounded conductor, bare wires grounding conductor. All right, there you go. Yes. All right. Got it. Okay, good. All right. So, um, all right. Um, I don't, if you don't have any other questions, I'm going to, I'm going to jump off the stream. I, uh, you've got some good questions today. So that's what I love. I love some of these great questions and I hope you walk away from the live stream with some information, you know, that you can use. Um, here's the, the last thing about termites. It's really kind of a shame um, I mean, there's two schools of thought on this, and I can understand it to a degree. Uh, for example, years and years ago, there was widespread use of DDT, very powerful uh, um, chemical, and uh, caused all kinds of problems down in the food chain. Uh, many years ago, there was a really great product for termite control called Chloridane, and it was really a good product, and they outlawed it. So you cannot get it anymore. I, I would have loved if I had been smarter back right before they outlawed it, I, I would have bought 50 gallons of it because it doesn't go bad. It, you know, they, they sold it in those dark brown gallon glass jugs. Uh, I, I have no idea, but I'll bet you there's a black market for chloridane right now. I, I don't know what you could get for a gallon of it, but it's such a good product. You might get 500 or $1,000 a gallon for that product. Um, but let me tell you, when you spray ground with chloridane, you're not getting termites. Simple as that. They're, they're, they're not coming. And the termites are smart. I'll say this about termites. I have a, I have a couple of really good columns on the website about termites. I, I, when I wrote those columns years ago, I interviewed top experts about termites. Here's how smart those guys are. So they have a colony and 
the queen communicates to the to the to the guys who are supposed to go out and get the food. Like, don't like you need to go out and forage all these different places. Do not bring back food to the nest all from one place. Not allowed. So the termites go, okay, okay, we got it. We got it. We got it. So off they go, man. Off they go. And some go this way, some go that way, some go this way. And they're going out to all these different places. So they are constantly foraging for new food sources. Because you know that old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket? Termites. That's why termites have been around for millions of years. They don't put all their eggs in one basket. <laughs> they they know to go, because they don't want to go eat some poison food and bring all this poison back to the colony, the whole colony die. All right, so uh, that's how smart they are. So they're constantly looking, and and eventually they're going to find your house. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. They're going to find it. All right, so... Uh, Smart animals, smart insects. I mean, they're not animals, they're insects. Uh, all right. Have I ever dealt with bed bugs? No, not, I don't have bed bugs. Uh, it was a big problem at a lot of hotels and motels in the last 10 years. Um, they're, they're problematic, but I don't, I don't have any problems with them. Uh, I had a friend that had bed bugs. Can you get rid of them? Yes. Yes, you can. There's all kinds of, just go to any pest control website. They tell you exactly how to get rid of the bed bugs. Uh, it's not that hard to do. Um, it's just that most people don't have the diligence to do it. They're not willing to take all the steps. But bed bugs are really easy to get get rid of. It's not a, not a problem. So you 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 can find all kinds of information. I'm sure if you go to the big pest control websites, you know who those big name brand names are. Uh, the one begins with an O. The other one begins with a T. Uh, I'm sure they're going to have articles on there. But they're smaller pest control websites that will tell you exactly what to do. Uh, yeah, it could be bad around your area. So you just have to, um, uh, you just got to make sure you don't bring those little guys home. Yeah, it's simple as that. So simple as that. Just don't bring those things into the house. So they don't fly around. They don't, you know, you've got to, you've actually got to bring them back in. So, but it's, it's easy to get rid of them. Well, it's not like you wave a magic wand, but I'm just saying, you can do stuff by yourself. You don't necessarily have to hire a pro and you can get rid of bed bugs. All right. Simple as that. Okay. I'm going to hit the road and then I will be here tomorrow and I'm going to show you those new craftsman tools. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on it because I can't really demonstrate them here. I can switch the batteries in and out to show you, show you that they work, but um, it'll be interesting to see it and it'll be interesting. And, and I'll share the price of the kit with you tomorrow. So, uh, what causes bed bugs? Um, well, they are just like, they're just like, um, they're just like you, William. I'm meaning you're in your house right now cause it's warm and dry probably. And there's food in your refrigerator. So the bed bugs go, we don't want to be outside where it's zero. <laughs> we want to be where it's warm. <laughs> and it's, Let's go to this. Let's find a bed. <laughs> so they they just naturally want to be in, in a situation like in a bed. And so, and in the folds of the mattress and in those nice little areas. And then they come out and they feed on you. They they suck your blood. Uh, <laughs> that's what they do. So anyway, just read up about them. They're, it's a, they're just like any other pest. They're just a nasty little pest. All right. You're welcome, William. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, exactly. Well, the questions come as they, you know, it depends. This is a rough time of year. Remember, I predicted that this would happen, William. I predicted we're, we're starting to get close every day. We're marching like a band or an army closer and closer to Christmas Day. Christmas is on a Saturday this year, right? So Christmas is less than three weeks away now. <laughs> so, so it's just going to get more and more hectic and we're going to have less and less live you know, people on the stream is what I predict. So that's okay. Um, that's why, you know, if the, if the streams end a little early, they end a little early, whatever. So I just stick around long enough to answer your questions. Thanks very much. I will be here tomorrow once again. Um, remember, Stain Solver, they make they make the live stream possible. And just get some. 
order some. Order this little bottle. It's a little sample bottle. Just order it and test it out. If you order it and you want to know how to use it, just email me and uh, I'll just tell me what you're trying to clean. I'll tell you exactly what to do so that you get fantastic results right away. Okay. Thanks so much for being here today. I will be back here um, tomorrow for sure. And I hope you're here too. And thanks so much for watching the live stream. Thanks for doing everything possible to get the word out about it. I really appreciate it. I'm Tim Carter, and this is Ask the Builder.